Welcome to the On-Premise IT Roundtable Podcast, the only show that dares to be both on topic and usually on location. Each time we meet, we bring together a group of IT luminaries to discuss a single concept. In this episode, we're discussing the readiness of enterprises to deploy AI applications, or not. Before we begin, let's meet who's on the panel today. Hi, I'm Chris Kuhneman. Uh, I'm an IT infrastructure aficionado, as well as a consultant, coach, and mentor. You can learn more at chriskuhneman.com. Hi, I'm Ayodele Odegala. I'm a responsible AI educator contracting at Microsoft, and I, my work focuses on the intersection of socio-technical solutions and AI. My name is Frederick Van Heren. I'm the founder of HiFence, which is active in consulting and services in the HPC and AI markets, and I can be found on Twitter as Frederick V. Heron. And I'm your host, Stephen Foskett, organizer of Tech Field Day and publisher of Gestalt IT. You can find me and sometimes the rest of these folks every week at Utilizing AI in your favorite podcast application, or of course at gestaltit.com. So let's start off by framing the question for those of you who aren't familiar with artificial intelligence. When we talk about AI, we're not talking about Mr. Data or some kind of science fiction concept. We're talking about practical applications of machine learning. And these things are everywhere. If you followed our recent Tech Field Day events, you've noticed AI-powered operations and uh, ML ops popping up in just about every presentation from storage to networking to security in the cloud. But what we've noticed over the years of doing our AI Field Day and of course the Utilizing AI podcast is that a lot of this stuff isn't quite well, enterprises aren't ready to take it up, even if it is ready for adoption. So what I'd like to do is start off, maybe Chris, can you talk to us a little bit about what are the challenges enterprises face in adopting AI solutions? Absolutely, I'll start with at least a few that I can kind of rattle off here. Uh, one is, you know, really just kind of the general approach to technology and whether or not a company's infrastructure is ready for AI uh, especially training, uh, but also inference at the edge. And those two things are different and there are different requirements, uh, but most enterprises that don't have an HPC background, a high performance computing background, may not have the smarts uh, and the equipment in their data center to, to run AI training in, in, a, in a big way. Uh, also, as I alluded to there, a skills gap, right? I mean, not everyone has data scientists on staff. And so if you're really trying to train models from scratch, you may be at a disadvantage. And then, you know, just that approach to training in general, there are a lot of ways to introduce bias and to, to mess things up by doing labeling wrong and looking at the way you have, have and handle your data wrong. Um, so those are three big ones anyway, right off the top. Yeah, I would say that if you look at enterprises, I mean, some of the challenges for enterprises, not just to practice AI, but in most cases, they already have some kind of form of HPC going on. So for them, it's not only a matter of jumping on the AI bandwagon in some of those organizations, it's, it's really how do you integrate AI into existing frameworks? And as Chris said, it can be very challenging if you don't have the right people around. And so the concept of switching over from a, a traditional waterfall strategy to DevOps and MLOps can be extremely challenging. And also, as Chris mentioned, there is training and inference, which are really two different challenges from an organizational standpoint. And those organizations traditionally need some help. Of course, there's always the, the greenfield operations, the smaller startups who can get out of the gate with, with straight out uh, AI. And they, of course, have the benefit of not having to drag along the, the existing uh, products they have been building. There's also a lot to be said about team composition when we're talking about having a various, uh, having a variety of not just types of people on your team. So we're talking about actual inter, uh, interpersonal diversity, but even on a professional level, having diverse skill sets and the ability to work with different kinds of data, like specifically text data, is not necessarily common for every single data scientist. So being able to understand what specialists you need and what kind of social scientists you need to work with, especially when we're dealing with enterprises that are in healthcare, finance, other really either regulated industries or have really high stakes. I think that's a good point. I mean, what, what I see a lot in the industry is that traditional AI really is in an, an R&D part of the organization, while on the other hand, you have the CIO 
who is more kind of don't rock the boat kind of a strategy while AI is a little bit more adventurous uh, from, from nature. So I do think there also that the cooperation between CIOs and CTOs can be very challenging for organizations to make decent progress with AI. Yeah, that's an interesting point, Frederick. And I wonder in your experience, if you've seen, you know, I, I kind of compare it to the, the bifurcation of DevOps and, and IT ops, where you've got kind of DevOps folks who are more application centric and kind of moving fast and producing things that are for the customers of the business. Whereas IT ops are a little bit more based in change control and stability and reliability and are typically more focused on employees of that company. And this is something that, you know, just as it spans research and production, it also kind of spans physical infrastructure and, and cloud workloads in a lot of times, right? So is AI something that, that folks can just go out and, and spin up a cloud instance and get working on? Or, or is this something that requires a, you know, on-premises capital investment? It's, it's funny you bring it up. I, I always refer to this as shadow AI. And that basically means that somebody in the R&D organization has a great ID gets a company credit card, goes to the public clouds and tries to experiment. So let's call that more experimenting than training, but the, the side effect of that is that if, if, the, if there's not good communication at the C executive level, that, that little experiment becomes a, a, a much larger training deployment in the public cloud. The challenge bubbles up when you go from training to production. And that's where really the CIOs are, are responsible for security, anything that goes outside of the company. So that's, that's where, where, where those people get, in, get, in, get involved. But it depends from company to company. Uh, it's the, more, the better the relationship between the CIO and the CTO, um, the higher the chances are that they will, will start the right way with their AI initiatives. I think that this uh, probably sounds pretty daunting to a lot of people in IT because I'm sure that they would have heard the things that we've just said and said, whoa, 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 we don't, not only don't we have the right data scientists, we don't have data scientists. Not only do we not have the right infrastructure, like we don't have anything like this. I mean, I don't even know what you guys are talking about. But if I could take the devil's advocate position, um, we're also starting to see some companies roll out sort of uh, packaged canned AI applications for specific point products like, you know, network management or, you know, firewall management or uh, storage operations or something. Is it really fair to say that enterprises aren't ready for AI generally when there are shrink wrapped applications that use AI that they can just sort of push the button on today? Well, Stephen, I think even with the availability of products that can help an enterprise move into AI, we still see some pitfalls. And, and one of them is kind of like the, the enterprises that have called themselves cloud first or trying to go cloud first. Um, we see a little bit of that with AI as well, where there's companies that are talking about AI first. They want to build an AI centric business. Um, they want to build an AI centric service. And, and I think that's a little bit backwards. Um, and what I mean is, if you're going to develop any kind of software for, for customers or employees, you typically don't say, hey, we're, we're going to be a Java first company, or, or we're going to be a Python first company. And machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, these are all tools that you can use to solve challenges, to build products, to increase the adoption of services, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I don't know that it's the same thing as saying, hey, we are, you know, AI only or AI first. And so I think just that general approach could be affected um, even with the tools being available, right? I think there's definitely also something to be said about that approach and how it has led engineering teams to believe that these are just technical solutions. So especially when we're looking at um, a varying amount of industry, so this can be for HR and hiring. When we're doing this kind of work that is incredibly sensitive, it's not just the technical pieces that are important. We have to think about them from this socio-technical perspective of what are the consequences. Let's say we have have a model that we are not entirely proud of or isn't perfect, perfect, and we put in a production, and people end up not getting called back for roles. Then we're facing more of this moral dilemma that we've tried to separate from the technical issues. But I think that is at the core of the same problem that you mentioned, Chris, with being AI first. That has led us to believe that it's technology first and not uh, a socio-technical problem we're attempting to solve with technical solutions. 
Yeah, that's and that's I think something that I, IT is woefully unprepared for. And I think not only you know it's one of those kind of unknown unknowns where companies maybe not haven't even considered the fact that a shrink wrap model might not be able to detect uh, things in one language or another, or things, uh, you know, people from, you know, different, different complexion or different, whatever. I mean, the models might not be suited for that at all. And IT has never faced that kind of challenge before with uh, a lot of the conventional applications that they're rolling out because they're used to things that are frankly very uh, binary, if you'll forgive the, the turn of phrase. I mean, it's, it's you know, a uh, dollar or not a dollar. It's, you know, a widget or not a widget. And they're not used to an application that might not be able to spot a widget because this widget looks different from some of the other widgets that it was trained on. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. I think it's also challenging for organizations to understand what AI can do for them. I mean, it's, it comes back a little bit to definition, but you know, in some conversations I had, people kind of describe AI as some voodoo where, you know, something goes in and then magically they get the answer. I think, and, and Stephen, to your point, you know, it's it's definitely not binary and it's also not 100% accurate, right? And even, even if somebody says, I have a model that is 99% accurate, that information by itself doesn't mean anything to me. That data could be from a, such a small subset and maybe from a single source that is really not a statistical representation for the market. So I think it's, so the expectation is one. The second is that uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the AI that is being or can be acquired today are really modules. They're not necessarily products. And, and that's where technology like transfer learning comes into play. And so transfer learning is where you start with an existing model. And of, obviously, you have to still make some modifications and adapt it. But it's not a big, as big of, of a challenge as normal. And I, I do believe that that's where, where the market is today, right? It's the ability to use those modules and to adapt them to your market. And, and it's, it's, I wouldn't use the definition shrink wrapped because it's, it's really out of the box. There's not much you can do from an enterprise perspective. You know, it worked for somebody, it doesn't necessarily, it's gonna work for you as well. But I think a lot of people are hearing about things that look shrink wrap that look ready to go. I mean, we, we see this when we're listening to the pitches from a lot of these um, AI ops companies and you know ML powered uh, systems. And they say, yeah, it's AI, isn't that great? It's awesome, it does all these things. And the implication is you don't really need to worry about it, worry about what it's doing or even think about it. And I think that that's really dangerous because of what we've just talked about, because if you're you know, if you're deploying, you know, firewall application that's going to use machine learning to identify, you know, hostile actors, you probably are going to come pretty quickly to uh, over rely on that machine learning algorithm and assume that this is some kind of magical, like you said, magical, you know, voodoo that just sort of pulls out the right information. When in truth, it's, um, it's really not like that. Right. The only area where I've seen it to be successful is if it's in the same vertical and similar data and, and similar applications. That's where the success rate as, as far as, you know, as close as shrink wrap, you, you can get it. You know, the life sciences um, and the self-driving car business are examples where there are components of the pipeline that you could call shrink wrap. But even there, you're only getting to like 80% accuracy in, you know, self-driving cars. I mean, that's why you can't, or you probably shouldn't, PSA, you shouldn't turn on uh, autonomous driving on busy city streets because it, it has no idea how to deal with a lot of these situations. And I think you mentioned a really great point, Stephen, which is how we talk about and market these products is almost more important than how well they actually work. Unfortunately, um, even though teams a lot of times do every step 
every single thing they can, make every single correct or recommended uh, fairness step or best practice, and still fall short in marketing when marketing and PR language chooses words like debiasing systems, or this is a gold standard, or a check mark, or seal of approval for fairness. When in fact, I think that's the end piece that we have really yet to solve is speaking accurately about how these products work and informing potential customers that yes, they can be incredibly smart solutions. However, they have vast limitations and being very open and transparent about those limitations, I think is an area of unfortunately really just failure on most organizations ends. Because unfortunately, customers then, because of marketing material, onboarding processes, and the way that we phrase specific terms about implementing these like prepackaged models, um, has led customers to believe that they don't need to do more introspection and more fairness testing and to specifically look for instances of, of bias. So I think we need to start addressing not just uh, the engineering solution, but how we end up marketing these products as well. It's really interesting, Idelli. And, you know, I see kind of two parallel pieces there. One is, you know, with regards to transparency, it can be the transparency of the algorithms, right, and the models themselves, which is understanding how they came to a certain decision, which will, I believe, allow us in more instances to, to spot bias, right, if we understand that this decision process was flawed somewhere along the line. Um, but I wonder, you know, if, if folks are looking for this kind of magical uh, device to, to provide them answers, even if we provided transparency in the way the model works, I mean, how many folks would actually dig into that? And so, and so that kind of comes to my second piece, which is, you know, how much of this is just about training about not, not even, you don't have to be a data scientist, right. But just how to interact with an artificial intelligence type program or, or machine learning device, right. Or something with deep learning and understanding how that works and, and where that bias might creep in, where errors might come out, um, how to train data, how to understand if the data is actually selected properly or not. Because, you know, some of the solutions that Stephen, you've alluded to are really trying to put AI in the hands of folks at the front lines of, of hospitals, of, of manufacturing plants, right? A lot of this stuff is around operational technology where folks who were running machines before are now tweaking models to, to get the machines to run on their own. And it, it seems like there's kind of a broad spectrum of folks that need to understand just the basics of how AI works in order to be able to interact with these systems in a way that doesn't cause problems. Yeah, I think that that's really the thing that that kind of rose the issue for me exactly that, Chris, because we're talking to some of these AI applications and and we're hearing, you know, oh, this is for, you know, automation of like, you know, monitoring emissions at a factory. And all you have to do is click and drag and draw a box around it. And, you know, and then it'll detect if there's, you know, toxic, illegal emissions of, and, and I'm like, whoa, 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 you're going to have somebody at a factory, like draw a box on the screen. And it's going to, that that's a little scary to me. What if they change it what if they like draw a box around the wrong thing because they have no idea what they're doing necessarily they're not um you know not only are they not data scientists they're not even like you know it people but that seems to me that a lot of these applications are really specifically targeted for people who are on the business side not on the it side right but i also i mean to what chris said it's it's uh, the marketing Marketing is a problem, right? I mean, marketing has a, has a habit of overhyping the technology. And then secondly, I also do think that while the technology and, and people might have adapted in an AI organization, I don't think the marketing team has adapted to, to sell and promote uh, AI from a marketing perspective. And that causes you know, a lot of issues. I, I know a lot of organizations that have difficulty selling their AI solutions for the simple reason that marketing has promoted it as something else and doing something more uh, than it really can. And then when, when eventually the engineering teams get together to kind of figure out what to do, there's such a high level of disappointment that they, they, they really want to walk, walk away from, from, from the whole thing. And, and that's, that's, that's maybe in general, I should say that a lot of AI, a lot of AI, initiatives fail, not necessarily at the technical level, but also at the expectation level, right? So a lot of people have different expectations 
and causes a lot of frustration. It's it's uh, some organizations um, that I talked to ha had tried uh, AI two years ago and then completely abandoned it. It's just pure disappointment. Um, and I think that that really doesn't help. But overall, I do think that it's improving. We're not there yet, but it's definitely improving. Uh, but it, but I definitely wish that that marketing organizations would kind of do a better job promoting not only AI, but also what their products can do. Yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned that, Frederick. So that's actually one of the issues I'm attempting to solve with my consultancy, Ethical AI Champions, because I, believe it or not, have a background in marketing and communications, but have spent enough years as a data scientist to actually understand what these models are doing. And I can tell you from inside experience, there is a massive gap between product teams, engineering teams, and how marketing looks at a product and positions the product to customers. And I think this actually ties back to what you were talking about, Stephen, on the um, application side and business users and end users being maybe employees that weren't really trained for this, a lot of the lack of education there and lack of training comes from the expectation that the model does so much more than it should or than it actually can. Um, so having that, those expectations set from the beginning and having and, for, and really forcing customers to accept that these tools aren't going to be magic and there will need to be more involvement on their side to make sure they're consistently working well, they're not seeing accuracy drift over time, um, making sure that they also have some technical skin in the game is really important because then downstream, it's much easier to create training and actually they provide that training for workers who are supposed to use this technology. I'm kind of just picturing uh, almost like some of the drug ads we have on TV, which is a list of disclaimers at the end of uh, any marketing for AI, where somebody reads really fast about all the things that it will and won't do. Um, but, but more seriously, I think, you know, maybe everyone doesn't need to understand K nearest neighbors or, or Bayesian regression, um, but, but just general things like what overfitting and underfitting are and, and what they cause. Uh, maybe things that, that a lot more people who are interacting with AI need to understand. Yeah, that's really smart. But I am loving the idea of drug ads, you know, may discriminate against the majority of the world's population. Um, you know, that kind of thing. I, th I think we definitely need to add that to the next uh, AI powered application uh, advertisement. Yeah, and I think another challenge regarding to data is um, data security and compliance. So you know, 15 years when we were collecting data by the buckets, you know, customers basically didn't care we were collecting data. They actually didn't want to know what we were doing with it. And those same customers today want to know which piece of their data ended up in, in which model, right? So I think that's also kind of um, an additional hurdle for enterprises to use data and certainly in Europe, you know, GDPR, not only are you using data, but they can actually force you to delete data as well, which can cause significant problems if that data is being used in a model to reproduce models. So it's it's not the main hurdle, but I definitely, if, if, if there was one one of the reasons why, why it's more difficult for enterprises today to use data or ac data they have access to, is, is uh, data compliance and security. And, and I guess today we call it data lineage, which is now becoming a standard request in contracts uh, where data is being collected. Yeah, that reminds me of a paper I read. Where I can't remember the authors or the name of anything of the paper, so that's not very useful. But um, it, it talked about just the intersection of privatized data and how, especially with kind of more advanced algorithms we're using now, it's no longer private or no longer anonymized, where you kind of de-anonymize data, especially if you take a couple data sets, pull them together, and you're doing some regressions on them, you actually can get to something where you're, you're really pinpointing personal identifiable information, even though you didn't collect any PII, uh, which is a really interesting problem, I think. Um, that paper in particular talked about introducing some randomness into the, into the data set, um, enough to be able to anonymize the data, but not enough to change the results which is a really interesting solution, but I'm sure there's others. And again, to your, to your point, Frederick, just kind of understanding how to handle data and, and where those problems are gonna pop up. Because I think a lot of people who may be just you know, crunching numbers, they don't even know that they're now uncovering you know, information that they shouldn't even have. Yeah, it, and anonymizing is, is, is something that we did in the early days, 
Um, but there is a, I think it was probably eight or nine years ago, AT&T Research decided to anonymize some of their data and make it public. And it didn't take more than a few days for somebody to reassemble and locate located some lady that was living in a cul-de-sac that was taking some medication. So, so for, it's because of that type of situations where, where the compliance people are not really in favor of, of, of eliminating data or masking data for the simple reason that there are just too many parameters where people could tie everything back together. I think this is really hard to solve, especially because this the severity of consequences can vary drastically depending on if it's your credit card information, which um, organizations have yet to really address. Um, what do we do? What are the consequences? Are people um, outside of finance specifically when someone is at the wrong end or um, has their data and information released, what is our mitigation process? What do we do as far as recourse? Is there a financial compensation? How or what are we um, offering to users? Because as you can imagine, if this is just you, you sign up for a credit card website and you just want to see your credit score, and then you have negative impacts to your credit just because you use this particular service. We have to also Try, try and understand from a user's perspective um, what this technology feels like when it goes wrong and not just what the implications are for our business. Because while we might see fines and we might understand that those are really frustrating things as a business overall, that's not really making up for the damage of someone having to try and spend the next few years attempting to repair their credit. So um, there we have to understand as far as consequences and things we can do to remediate some of these uh, issues. Right. And I think, you know, talking about customers, customers already mistrust organizations, right? So without AI, there's already enough data leakage, right? So the last thing people want is is your your raw data being stolen or being used against you. The last thing they want is that somebody is building a model to 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 come up with a, a greater offense uh, you know towards your 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 financial and your 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 own information so i i do think there's also a lot of mistrusts uh, from that perspective i do remember when we tried to sign contracts with organizations where we'd have to share data i mean they were freaking out not from an ai perspective but just the fact that the data was being collected well that's the the scariest thing is that I don't see this getting better. I only see it getting worse. You know, in a way, it reminds me of when companies began implementing ERP products or, uh, you know, when they started doing other kinds of, uh, you know, data and analytics. And it, they just opened up a can of worms that then they had to live with and caused all sorts of, you know, escalating costs, uh, you know, projects that never ended, you know, things that were never implemented. And, and, and frankly, it, kind of sounds like AI is like that. So I'm going to give each of you a chance to, I guess, uh, is, there a pro is there a positive prognosis here or are we just uh, not going to be able to do this? And I guess um, let's start with uh, Ayadeli because uh, you didn't introduce yourself first. So you can do, you can do this part first. <laughs> Wonderful. So I would say there is a positive prognosis, especially for organizations who are taking tangible steps towards not just algorithmic accountability, but truly implementing responsible AI and not just AI in general. Um, my biggest tips, I would say, are to work with social scientists and work with organizations that are specialized in areas that your team is not. So um, looking outside of technical skills, but looking to address the historical context that is tied to your data and have data audits be a normal thing that you are open to. That's what I would suggest. How about you, Chris? Do you see any uh, light at the end of this tunnel? Uh, I think so, right? I mean, you know, as we in this conversation kind of discovered really quickly is that there are companies out there that are producing products that are going to help make the technical aspects of deploying AI easier. Uh, as you mentioned, we're going to talk to some of them um, this week, I think, actually, at, uh, at AI Field Day. And so from the infrastructure layer, from the kind of modeling, from the training, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of layers of technology getting laid out there that, that help make this um, easier technically. 
to Ayadeli's point, I think that I want to definitely underline that idea of kind of the, the social biases that can be introduced here, and then really th that idea of a responsible AI needs to be on the forefront. And I see a lot of conversations happening about that, so I'm, I'm pretty positive there. But I also, in addition to saying, yes, we need social scientists and, and the historical context of the data involved, um, that there are other ways to, that bias can, can mess up things too. And so, you know, biased data can cause uh, factory machinery to, to go amok just as much as it can cause facial recognition to go amok. And so, you know, there's some, some real world consequences to this. And so maybe just underlining that idea of, of responsible AI and, and having enterprises look at it that way will, will be the answer to, to move this forward. Yeah, I think enterprises are making progress. I mean, we're not we're not there yet, but areas where where AI has been successfully um, deployed and in some cases productized are in verticals where organizations were ahead of the curve and and for for um, problems that previously there was no solution. Let, for example, self driving cars and so on. Those are organizations that didn't have much before. And so they jumped on AI and spent a lot of uh, a lot of money and, and effort to move things forward. And those are also the organizations that that have a better understanding of what AI can do, how they need to set themselves up, and also taking advantage of, of new innovations and technology. Um, these are the companies that that also are very active in the open source community and are delivering open source solutions that can be shared by other verticals that might have similar data, but not doing exactly the same, but where they can benefit. And I also do think that, that uh, you know, data in general, uh, the misconceptions about, you know, collect as much data as you can, it's really collect as much good data. Um, it's kind of a catch 22 because the best data you can collect is the, the data you get out of your own product, right? So, but in order to deliver your product, you need a, you need some kind of a model. So you kind of have to figure out how to start. Um, and then I, I also agree with, 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 with the other speakers regarding to, uh, you know, privacy and, and compliancy and, uh, but I, I as, a, as a technologist, I have to admit that privacy is, you know, it's, it's not getting better, right? There's more of your data spread around. Um, it's, I, I think the assumption that, that we're going to keep our data more private than, than in the past, I think that that's, that's not reality. I think the best we can do is to, to protect ourselves as much as we can, but I think it's, it, it's, it's going to get worse than, than what it is today. Well, thank you very much, panel. This has been uh, great. And I think I can sum it up by saying, no, the enterprise is not ready for artificial intelligence. Uh, Fred, where can we follow you and uh, learn more about uh, your thoughts on this subject? Right. So all my adventures, I post them all on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is the best way to figure out what I'm, what I'm doing. And then the uh, second option is Twitter. To follow me on Twitter is Frederick V. Heron on Twitter. How about you, Ayadeli? Yes, on Twitter and on most social media, I am Data Scibae, Data S-C-I-B-A-E, or you can find me on my website, iadeliodavella.com. Uh, all of my stuff uh, can be found at chrisgrundeman.com. Uh, I'm also having a lot of great conversations on LinkedIn, and you can follow me on Twitter at Chris Grundeman. You can find me on most social media networks at S. Foskett, and you can find my writing at gestaltit.com. Also, as I mentioned, you can find me on the Utilizing AI podcast, which is published every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time. So thank you, everyone, for joining us for the On-Premise IT Roundtable. If you enjoyed this discussion, please subscribe, rate, and review the show, and uh, please do share this show with your friends. This podcast is brought to you by gestaltit.com, your home for IT coverage from across the enterprise. For show notes and more episodes, go to gestaltit.com slash podcast. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.